Voy a un mosquetón anti-stress. Ah. 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 Ah.
uh, didn't say that this change is related to a sensor that is as a digital output. So there are some sensors that have digital output and some sensors like an encoder that we'll see next and other sensor that have um, analog output. In the case of an analog output sensor, ideally the, the resolution is, is, uh, is infinite. While um, in the case uh, of a digital sensor is related to the word, to the, to the binary number that we use to, to, to digitalize the amplitude that we measure. So in the case of an analog sensor, uh, we, uh, the resolution it's derived from the electronic equipment that we use to measure the, sing the signal, for example, the A to D converter, or from the noise level. So we see, if we read an analog sensor like a load cell or a force sensor, we see that the signal is very noisy due to the, uh, there is some level of noise due to the, to the electromagnetic uh, disturbances. And, uh, and uh, we know that we cannot measure any force uh, in that uh, uh, range. So we can say that uh, the, the resolution is it's, uh, it's certainly at least at the noise level. So as we said, the proprioceptive sensor are the sensor that measure the internal state of the robot, which means positions and velocity of the joints and acceleration uh, of the base, for example, or if, if we are talking about a floating base or, or the link itself because in some cases we might want to know also the acceleration uh, of the link. Uh, for example, if we want to detect an impact early on without uh, relying on, uh, on the force sensor at the joints. And the classes, inside the class of proprioceptive sensors, we have, as you said, encoders uh, to measure position. And we will see that the velocity is derived from encoder readings. We have, accelerometers and gyroscope. Accelerometers measure the uh, linear and angular acceleration, while the gyroscopes, they measure the angular velocity. And, and this, this kind of sensor are used, are used to close the loop, so to do motion control, to do calibration, kinematic calibration, uh, identification of the dynamic parameters. Identification is whenever we want to know uh, the parameters, the inertial parameters to put into our dynamic model. For example, the numbers to put in our URDF model. Normally, uh, usually these parameters are given by CAD, the data. So the designer sets a certain density in his, in his CAD drawing and from the CAD, you can extrapolate the mass of the link that you draw or the central mass and the inertia tensors. But of course, this really a rough, a rough approximation because the density you set, you don't really know. I mean, maybe there are in the links, there are some plastic parts, some steel parts, maybe you put an average density. So the numbers you get in terms of, uh, especially in the tensor of inertia are often wrong or 20% wrong, for example. And if we want to do accurate control, we need to identify what is the real value of the mass of a link, of the, of the center of mass of a link, especially, and also the inertia tensor. So identification is deriving the trajectories that are uh, rich enough in terms of frequency content, in terms of um, creating forces that are dependent on the center of mass position, such that we can infer the uh, values and identify the values of the central masses of the masses of the tensor of inertia. Um, Exteroceptive sensor instead measure the external quantities to the robots that represent the interaction with the environment. And this interaction uh, can happen at different levels. Uh, for example, if we have a contact force, this will create a, um, um, uh, some force at the joint level. And at the joint level, we, we, we can measure the joint force through a torque sensors or a load cell. A load cell is used whenever we have a, a linear actuator, like a piston, and a torque sensor is whenever you have only um, uh, 
um, an actuator that is is uh, related coupled with a with a revolt joint and is is measuring a moment at the joint. And both torque sensors and load sensors are mainly uh, built with a technology that is based. Uh, it's called uh, strain gauges. We will see them in detail. Then we also have uh, um, contact sensor, force torque contact sensor 6D that are mostly put at the end of factor. And these sensors measure both uh, 3D forces and uh, moments. So that's why they are called 6D six axis sensors. And uh, uh, we also contact switches to detect the contact. They are just on off and tells you there is contact or no contact. Proximity sensors that are used to check the presence of an object or not. They are very limited range. Vision sensors, they are also something coming from externally from the robot. The, the, in essence, the, the perception of the, of the environment in terms of, uh, uh, of visual uh, having a visual feedback of the environment. Sound, smoke, we, we have many, many, many different kinds that go underneath this umbrella of extraceptive sensors. And as I said, they used for controlling interaction with the environment, uh, obstacle avoidance, for example, in the case of visual sensors, uh, check the presence of objects to be grasped, and self-localize the robot in a, in a, in a map, in a, in a building a map and self-localizing in a map, navigation in an unknown environment. And uh, this is an example of, of an encoder that we mounted, for example, in, in the IQ robot. They are quite old, but at the time they were very um, cutting edge because they had 80,000 count per evolution. We'll see afterwards what this means. Then uh, we have uh, IMU. IMU is um, it's a package that um, uh, contains uh, both um, an accelerometer, uh, a gyroscope, an inclinometer, and a magnetometer. Inclinometer is, um, as I said, accelerometer measure angular and linear acceleration. Gyroscope angular velocity. Um, Inclinometer measure the orientation with respect to the gravity. And the magnetometer tells you the heading. So how you are moving with respect to the North Pole. Okay. And this is normally a very bad measurement because uh, it really affects by affected by the presence of a rotating uh, motor, for example, that creates a magnetic field and it completely disturbs the reading of the sensor. So you need to be very careful when you rely on a magnetometer because it's, it's not working. And you need to, you will see there are other uh, ways to, to obtain the heading. Uh, as that upset these sensors, as you said, we have here uh, the load cells uh, that we mounted on IQ on the, on the left. And uh, this is the torque sensor that we designed and we, glued, uh, we, we, we custom made uh, this for, for, the, for our robot. Then we have um, infrared camera. This is an example like a, a Kinect or stereo camera. This is a Bumblebee camera. It's quite old, no longer used. Now we use more like a, a real sense camera um, or Intel cameras that are uh, more um, modern and have better, better performances. And Finally, there are laser cameras. These are called LIDARs. They are normally mounted on self-driving cars to, to build them up while the car, on, online while the car moves. And these usually are very precise. Everything is clear? So uh, position sensors, they provide us an electrical signal proportional to the to the displacement, linear or angular, depending on if you are talking about a rotation, of, um, a revolute joint of a, a prismatic joint, um, for example. Um, and in case of linear displacement, um, we, um, we 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 can use uh, potentiometers, 
um, and uh, linear variable differential transformers LVDT that are this, these guys uh, that in essence is like a, it's like a linear potentiometer uh, that changes its resistance according to the position of this of this, uh, of this of this pool of this of this sensor. Um, for the angular displacements, uh, we have optical encoders that I said they are digital sensors, pulse sensors, and potentiometers. The sensor are analog sensors, and potentiometer are again analog sensors. So they need a uh, A to D converter to be read, um, while the digital ones that you can directly connect to the acquisition board through the counter input. Because acquisition boards, they have analog input. And they have digital input and also counters that detects the number of edges uh, of this digital signal. Um, we will see we will see how how they are working. Um, in general, the sensors most used in robotics are the uh, angular displacement ones, uh, because uh, even in case of linear motion, let's say this is a a prismatic joint that moves in this direction. Um, there is like a, um, in this case, a, a transmission, for example, is, there is always uh, a transmission that transforms the rotational motion of a motor into a linear motion. And of course, it is more convenient to measure the angular, display, the angular displacement of the motor because for a very small, uh, it, it will have much higher accuracy because for many rotation of the motor you have a, a, a very very small uh, motion of the of the of the of the linear of the prismatic joint so it's more convenient to read the the angular displacement for accuracy um, a potentiometer in instead is very simple it's the most simple one uh, that we have um, it's in essence a resistor a variable resistor that is normally a, a brush moving on a thin film of resistive material. And this brush can be moved along the surface of this, of this material and um, create a variable resistance between the brush and one of the terminal of this, of this resistive pad. And the brush, as the brush moves towards one end or uh, to the other end of the of the resistive material, there will be a change in the resistance proportional to the travel distance. So here we see the resistive material, and we see the brush in black, and the angular displacement theta that tells the angular uh, position of this this point with respect to our reference, and we have ground connected to one point of the resistive material and the supply voltage connected to the uh, other point of the resistive material. Um, this part of the, of the resistive material between the uh, V-out, uh, the output is connected to the brush, and this part between the output and the and supply is a, is, a, is a resistance R1 that is variable, and uh, uh, the other part is a resistance R2 that is also variable with the position of the brush. So the equivalent circuit is, is this. And I don't know if you have done a, uh, some electronics. It, this is a very simple voltage divider. Do you know what, what is that? So, so who knows what, what a voltage divider is? You? OK. Uh, voltage divider is, is it's, um, it's computing, in essence, the, the output voltage uh, of the uh, at this point uh, um, with a relationship of the of the of the resistances of the, uh, for example, uh, Archie resistance uh, with respect to the total resistance. So to compute V out, we multiply the supply voltage, and this supply voltage will be divided uh, in a, a voltage drop. At, potential difference on the resistor R1 and a potential difference on the resistor R2. Since we are considering ground as zero reference uh, and V out, we are interested into this part. So uh, this is the, the equation that represents the, the, the output. 
And as I said, uh, R1 is resistance between the uh, brush and the supply, and, um, and R2 resistance between the brush and the second terminal of the ground. Um, and we see that if um, um, what, what happens if uh, the brush is completely uh, in this position? What happens, in your opinion? How much the uh, output voltage is? See? Why? R1, no resistance R1 or R2? R1 is zero, so R2 over R2 uh, uh, nullifies, um, simplifies, and we have V out equal to V. What happens if the brush is in the other direct, in the other end, uh, terminal position? Is zero because uh, R two is going to zero, so zero over anything uh, non-zero, it's zero. Okay. Uh, therefore, we have um, a way to measure position because we said that we have maximum voltage in one position and linearly drops to zero in the other position. So um, we can uh, define this um, uh, relationship between voltage and position. And potentiometers are very popular because they are inexpensive. They're very cheap. They don't require special signal conditioners, just a very simple circuit. So um, that's why people like them but they suffer of uh, very, very limited accuracy. Um, and normally this, this is um, in the range of 1% of the range. And they, after a while, they, they wear, they have uh, subject to, they are subject to mechanical wear. So they, they, they lose their, their, their property. They, they start to malfunctioning and they can break. Everything is clear? Okay. Um, in terms of the encoders, um, we have um, op encoders are optical optical encoders. They are called optical encoders, uh, and they use rotating disks uh, with some little holes little windows in this disk. Um, there is like a, an emitter um, that is normally a, a, a LED, LED or uh, some, some light, light emitter that creates a, 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 a beam that passes through the openings in the disk and is received uh, to, from the detectors, is, is detected by a, a photo, photoresistive um, uh, component. And uh, as the encoder uh, disk is rotated with a shaft, the light uh, beam that was emitted by the emitter is broken and restored and broken and restored according to the, the spokes of this, of this disk. So you can, I think I have a drawing. The next next slide you will see, um, and these encoders have digital output, as I say, and they are of two fundamental types uh, that are the absolute encoders and the incremental encoders. And the incremental encoders are um, also known as relative encoders. So you see here what I was saying. Um, These are the, the encoder wheel. These are the, uh, the holes, the little windows, and the emitter is inside here. Or it's another point. Where is another pointer? It's gone. Okay. Um, and this encoder is the ones that are the ones that you have, for example, in a mouse, uh, in a mouse pad. Um, they are put at uh, 90 degrees. One measure the uh, position in the X direction and the other one measure the position in the uh, Y direction. And they are making uh, rotate 
they, they, they are put in rotation from the, from the mouse wheel, mouse uh, sphere, sorry. Um, so as I said, there are two, um, is a rotating disc with uh, not only a single set of, of, uh, of uh, holes, um, but because this is very simple only for the mouse, but in the, in the robots, we have two tracks. So we have uh, two sets of, of um, old uh, pattern. And, and we have still this infrared LID uh, that is sensed by the photoreceiver underneath. And typical encoder can have from two to thousand of, of windows per ring. As I said, for IQ, we have 80,000 windows. And these windows create light pulses uh, during the motion of the wheel. And these light pulses um, of dark and light, dark and light, they can be converted into electrical pulses. Um, the, um, the angular displacement in uh, incremental angular displacement are measured by counting this, the number of, of pulses that we call counts um, along the revolution of the, of the encoder. And the resolution is computed uh, dividing the 360 degree uh, angle, uh, full turn, or uh, due to the number of, of counts. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. To add the accuracy um, to, the, to the reality encoder, um, we need to add uh, more windows to the existing ring. So if you have many, many windows, you per, per, per revolution, um, you have much more possibility uh, of, of creating pulses. And so you have, are able to have a better resolution because you're able to discriminate uh, between uh, uh, smaller angular displacements. So any is number of counts per revolution. Um, yes. Sorry, uh, I don't, uh, I don't understand uh, the how the resolution is computed with the formula that you. So uh, this is the. Um, so if you do one wheel uh, rotation, like you are doing three hundred sixty uh, degrees turn. So you need to associate uh, the number of counts uh, um, to the 360 degrees rotation. And the more counts you have, um, yeah, actually you're right, um, it's wrong. <laughs> there shouldn't be, um, sorry, um, it should be not to, to, the power, to the power of n, but uh, only n, any. So the number of, of count per evolution. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, Thank you very much. It's it's wrong. <laughs> In the absolute encoders, it's, it's like that. It's we will see later. Yes, good good point. Uh, so yeah, resolution is is 360 divided by the NE. Uh, so more counts uh, for revolution. The 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 smaller uh, uh, display so we can detect with a single uh, pulse, and we will see here. For example, uh, while we move this wheel, uh, the pulse we create a square wave. And uh, these tracks, um, A and B, uh, are shifted. Um, I said that there are two tracks, and they are shifted 90 degrees. Why? Because we want to know the direction. So if we just have one wheel, and we rotate against the emitter, we have light, no light, light, no light. We count the edges that represent the pulses of light and no light. And we know that, I don't know, we did uh, 10 counts, we know the revolution, uh, the resolution, and we, uh, we, we can compute the, the, the angle that we, that we move. But we don't know if the encoder was moving in one direction or in the other direction. Um, while having two tracks, of, of, of uh, openings, shift of 90 degrees, uh, we know that uh, whenever one is rising and uh, the other one is it's rising after that, we know that 
the uh, the uh, direction of rotation because uh, if um, the A signal leads the B signal, then the encoder is rotating clockwise. If instead the B signal is leading the A signal, then it's rotating counterclockwise. So we can, by, the, the, um, by this trick, we can detect also the direction of rotation. And so um, with the, our um, uh, electronics, we can uh, decide if add the count or subtract the count to the, to the one that we, we computed before. Um, if the encoder only rotates in one direction, then you, you could ideally only uh, count the pulses for one ring to determine the, the angular distance, the angular displacement. You don't need two tracks. Uh, if you increase the velocity of the shaft of the encoder wheel, then the signal period is decreased and the square wave becomes more frequent. And one point of encoders is that whenever you power them on, they start always reading from zero. Uh, so uh, you need a calibration phase whenever you turn them on to uh, understand uh, what is the absolute position. And this uh, calibration phase is called homing, homing procedure in, in general. And it means to move the, the motor toward the, uh, from the moment where the, 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 the started, the, the, the position of the angular position where it started, it could be, could be any, moving toward the end stop, check what are the values of the counts from the encoder, and then uh, knowing that that uh, end stop uh, angular position uh, is known because we know what, what, for example, is a reference position that we start to count the angular displacement, then we can uh, uh, subtract this offset all the time and um, have an absolute position of the uh, angular position. I don't know if, if you if I was clear enough. Um, and this is this is very uh, annoying because you would like to plug power power the robot and, and have it working. You don't want to oh, go in here and then go back to the to the start position. So this is a problem that we have. Um, uh, in our uh, new robot, it's called Solo. Um, I asked my student to send me a video of this homing procedure, but was at home, so I, <laughs> I don't have it. Uh, and um, we could use the, for counting, uh, uh, only the rising edge of the square wave, on the rising edge, or uh, also the, the, um, the downward edge, so the falling edge, I think it's called. And in this case, we can uh, uh, improve the resolution um, and uh, um, we can uh, uh, have the, 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 the a bigger number of, 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 of counts for the same uh, number of, of uh, physical windows. So if you have, uh, uh, for example, for around um, Turn complete turn. We have to twenty thousand electrical cycles. Uh, we can in with this trick uh, multiply by four and get eighty thousand pulses per turn, and and they increase the final resolution. Uh, in this case, yeah, we have very very good resolution encoders in IQ. Um, now they are around uh, uh, off the shelf around uh, hundred eighty thousand, so they are even higher. But this is this is a quite good uh, resolution for a for a, um, to measure the, the, the joint position. Um, absolute encoder. Instead, they um, directly measure the angle of the shaft. So we don't have to uh, to do the homing procedure. And whenever we start up the robot, um, they, they give a reading. 
and this reading is it's uh, it's uh, it's um, it's always the same if we 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 start in the same position. So um, while in the relative encoder we always start from zero, so if we start in another position, we start from zero, and we need to do the homing procedure to to get it to the end stop and uh, have some idea of the absolute position of the joint. And see if the chat there asking something. No. So the um, the outputs of the um, absolute encoder is a is a is a binary number and is, is or is a digital uh, output. And normally it's uh, encoded in a, a binary number or in a, uh, using a gray code. And the gray code, the advantage is at as less reading errors because only one bit changes between um, one code and the other. Uh, so we need to think about uh, um, an absolute encoder as a, an element with n uh, rings, where the uh, n, n rings with with uh, with different uh, holes uh, inside, uh, and uh, the outer ring represent the most significant digit of the binary number that represent the the, the output, the digital output, and the inner ring is the least significant digit of the code, and more rings you have. Uh, you have one emitter for uh, and detector for, for each ring, so it starts to be complex uh, to have many, many rings, and implies that you have more, meet, more bits uh, to represent uh, your, your uh, angular measure, and, but also uh, means higher resolution. Um, here you have an example, for example, it's just a, a, um, an example that is uh, um, uh, not representative of, of something real because you don't do much with an absolute encoder of three bits because you're able to uh, compute, in essence, uh, only discriminate uh, only 45 degrees because you have 360 uh, divide uh, 2 to, to the power of 3. <laughs> As you see in the next slide, the resolution is, is um, computed by dividing 360 degrees uh, for two to the power of the number of bits. And, but this is good to, to, to show you, for example, the difference between the binary code and the gray code. So uh, with three rings, we are able to generate eight binary number. And you will see here that between this number and this number, you this bit becomes zero and this one becomes one. So you have two changes, while here in the gray number, only one bit is changing. So if there is some noise associated to, to, the, to the reading because of, of external noise, then it's less prone to error. Um, and as in the case of left encoders, there are uh, circuitry uh, and software needed uh, to get the, uh, Digital output. This is a, a picture of a 13-bit uh, absolute encoder uh, open. You see the electronics is usually on top of the encoder itself to reduce the the, the coupled noise. And this is what I was saying: um, the encoder wheels, the absolute encoder wheels. In the relative one, you remember we had two uh, tracks shifted 90 degrees. Here we have. Uh, many, uh, at least 10 here or or, uh, or eight. And and you can see here that uh, they, they, they are carved in a way to create a, a, a digital, uh, a, a gray code. Um, sorry, it's with A, um, a gray encoding. Uh, the big advantage is, is that they don't, uh, they're ready to measure uh, at the start. They don't need any homing procedure, um, but they um, both, we need to say that both uh, uh, absolute and, and, and relative encoders, they, they have a problem. And this problem is called quantization. Do you know what quantization is? 
What is? Perfect. Yeah. So, uh, in essence, what we said, we we digitalize. Uh, um, we need to. We, we have a, a, um, a position which is continuously change, and we can only represent with a digital number, or with a certain number of bits, or with a certain number of um, counts. And so we we lose uh, something in that. And. What uh, uh, we lose uh, can be represented as, as, as noise, quantization noise. So this is the, on the left hand side, is a um, true value of the measured variable. And here you have the quantized measured. So it's having a, a limited countable set of possible outputs. Uh, that is more smaller than the set of possible inputs values. And plus there is the error representation that is, we can uh, model as, as, a, as a random variable. Uh, as I said, the resolution um, is related, uh, is the quantization uh, level um, and is uh, two pi divided to, to, the, part, to the number of, of the bits. And this is, the way uh, quantization can be uh, done, uh, it can be done by truncation, for example. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, Professor. Means uh, we approximate the measure to the closest uh, integer uh, uh, number. Uh, that will be the closer to what? To closer to zero in case of positive number, and closer to minus infinity in the case of, uh, sorry, closer to zero in case of positive numbers and closer to minus infinity in case of negative number. And the error we, com we, com we, we, we do in, in, in doing this approximation is this, and it will be, we'll have a minimum of zero and a maximum of Q, where Q is the quantization level. The other way to, to, to do quantization is, is rounding, which, which is uh, approximating to the nearest integer. And in this case, the error is smaller, is going from minus Q half to plus Q half. Um, as I said, in both cases, they um, can be described as, as uh, white noise. Um, random noise and with uniform probability density equal to one over two, but this is this is just a detail. What is important to know about quantization noise is that they create problem. It create problems whenever we want to measure velocity. So usually we don't have a velocity sensor and we differentiate by numerical differentiations. <laughs> The readings from the position from the encoder readings uh, to get the velocity and this is another uh, way of doing that is to measure the time that passes between two processes but this is not practical at high speed so uh, it's only working for very very low speeds so what we do is do uh, numerical differentiation of the uh, digital measures of position and and to be realized uh, on, on our computer we use a backward differentiation formula that is this one uh, so we take the uh, encoder measure uh, at the um, at the previous point at the actual point uh, where we, at the actual measurement we we subtract the 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 position of the previous measurement and we divide by the time interval between the two measurements, which is uh, TS, which is a sampling time. Um, so if you, um, 
do so whenever you have um, a big change of um, of uh, a small uh, a change of, of, of in, in correspondence of the change of, uh, of, the, of the reading you have uh, you have a spike and you see these spikes are bigger as the sampling time decreases so if we sample at higher frequency <laughs> things get worse not only that not only that um, um, you, you would say um, you, you will see what, what happens if we uh, another problem whenever we sample at high frequency. Um, what what can we do is uh, to use filters to uh, filter out these these spikes and have a, um, a more cleaner signal. But the problem is with filters is that you cannot exaggerate in in putting them uh, a heavy filtering because it introduces delays. And this is uh, how a velocity signal with quantization error looks like, um, and how would you uh, like to filter it to have a cleaner signal um, output that you can use in, in control. Everything is clear? Okay. Uh, as I said, there is not only this problem, um, but we have also a minimum bound on the speed that we can measure. Uh, that depends on the sampling frequency. So uh, think about, again, uh, quantization level or resolution uh, R and the uh, sampling frequency uh, that corresponds to a, a sampling time TS. Assume a 12-bit encoder which was quite old and was used like uh, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and if we compute the solution is 0 0.87 degrees, which seems like a okay resolution. But whenever you go to compute the minimum speed that you can uh, measure, uh, the minimum speed that you can measure is the one where we have a change uh, of um, one uh, quantization level in one sampling interval. So, um, because if we, the, the, there is no change, that the, the speed is zero. Um, and how much is in this case? So we said uh, one quantization level is 0 0.87 degrees divided by uh, 0 0.01, which is a sampling, typical sampling frequency of one kilohertz, and we get a minimum bound of 87 degrees per second in the, in the minimum measurable velocity. So what we do, the, the, the only way in, in this case um, is to uh, or increase the number of bits, so increase the resolution of the encoder, or reduce the sampling frequency. But we will see that reducing the sample frequency is not a nice thing to do because you could introduce aliasing problems. Everything is clear? OK. Um, then uh, we have also uh, contest switches. These are normally used to. Uh, for example, detect uh, in, in the case of, uh, of uh, our legged robot, um, we want to detect this, the contact state change early on whenever it happens. So there are two ways to detect the contact. Think about the, uh, the robot is, and the factor is touching um, the surface, and whenever it touches, creates the contact force is mapping to torques at the joints. And these torques can be used to detect the contact. But to do so, I need to discard the effort that is needed to, for example, to compensate for the gravity. I need to know the model of the, of the robot, remove the um, torques that is needed 
to, to perform the motion that I'm doing. Maybe I'm, I'm moving like this, I'm doing a certain motion. And from that, uh, after you move that, then you can get the influence of this contact force. And on top of that, you need to decide, okay, what is a, a contact? Whenever the contact force that I estimated through the torques, it's beyond the 50 Newton. Then I say there is a contact. But if you have a, an error, an accuracy in inaccuracy in your model, then you might misestimate the amount of contact force and you might trigger the contact in a wrong way. Maybe you are still in the air or you are just moving fast. You're moving faster, you have bigger acceleration and, and your model is wrong. So you, you get more torque at the joint that whenever, than what you expect and then you, you think it's a contact force. So the better way is to use a contact switch that is just an on-off uh, switch that is not, not latching. So it's just uh, um, interrupting or, or uh, diverting uh, the current uh, and opening the circuit. And, and in, uh, in general, it gives you a, a very reliable on-off state, binary state, and this is um, a picture of, of one of these contact sensors that we implemented in IQ that was sensitive to contacts um, in all the directions. So there was like a, a very um, refined leverage mechanism that is able to um, map on the contact switch, also uh, uh, contact lateral contacts. And this is an exploded view, uh, cut view of this. Here you have, you have the contact switch, you have the lever mechanism, and here you have the, the, the foot, the football, which is what we have uh, at the end of an uh, IQ leg. And there is like a springy mechanism here that was mapping this, this, uh, this motion. Uh, finally, in, in some industrial application, um, so there is a question from the audience. True value of a measured variable. Uh, ah, okay. They they were asking about uh, what is the true value. Uh, so the the true value is the is the is the, uh, the real position that we want to measure that we approximate with a digital number. So we do uh, an approximation of this true value because we have a limited number of um, um, outputs that we can use to represent this number. So we, we, we do an error doing this approximation. This error is the, um, is the quantization, uh, quantization error, epsilon, that we saw. Um, Here we have um, uh, LD, LDR that are light dependent, dependent resistors. And you can find these um, kind of sensors, for example, industrial application, whenever you have a mobile robot that needs to follow a line or a, a light path. And so it needs to be able to detect the, the light uh coming from an emitter and with uh, such a component uh, um, it's, it's a component that uh, uh, changes its resistance according to the intensity of the light and usually uh is resistant change uh quite a lot from uh, a value of mega ohm uh, whenever it's in bright light to a very low resistance whenever it's in the dark. 
and the change in resistance is nonlinear, and but is also um, quite slow. Um, they are known as spot resistors, and in in general, they look in synergy uh, with a photo uh, emitter like a LED, and they are very uh, simple to read. They can be read as in the case of a potentiometer from uh, a very simple voltage divider. So uh, the LED creates the light, then uh, influences the resistance of the, of the light-dependent resistor. And this uh, output voltage goes up and down according to the change in resistance of this element. Then the uh, last uh, um, the last proprioceptive sensor is um, um, the inertial sensor. Um, inertial sensors are uh, the ones that in measure inertial quantities, uh, first or second derivatives of the position or the orientation. So, um, like acceleration, angular acceleration, uh, angular velocity, uh, linear acceleration, and linear velocity uh, is, is not measurable. We will see this. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and they measure uh, these quantities of what? Of, of, of a rigid body that uh, they are attached to. So if you want to measure the acceleration of your base, uh, of your mobile robot, you attach in a, a solidly uh, accelerometer into certain point of the, of the, of the base. Um, and as I said, there are accelerometer, gyroscopes, um, uh, inclinometers, and, uh, and, and, and magnetometers. Um, and an inertial uh, measurement IMU, uh, initial measurement unit package that is called IMU, embeds in, in, embeds in a single package uh, uh, an accelerometer uh, for linear angular acceleration, a gyroscope for angular velocity, and a magnetometer that tells you the heading with respect to North Pole, and the inclinometer that detects the orientation with respect to the gravity. This mean, means finding the roll and pitch um, quantities uh, of the orientation. We will see this uh, in the kinematic lectures, uh, this kind of uh, representation of orientation that are called Euler angles. Um, we have different classes of IMU. This one, for example, is from the microstrain company and is a model that costs between two and three thousand euro and they're called industrial grade. They are the most used one in uh, our robots or more uh, um, high quality robots like uh, Boston Dynamics one, uh, a better IMU is used, which is based on optical um, technology. This is based on MEMS technology, so or integrated circuit and this is called tactical grade and cost around 25,000 euro. While there is also navigation grade IMUs that are very, very expensive. I don't know how much they cost, and they are used only in helicopters or military applications where you really need uh, high accuracy. Why? Be because if you have such a good IMU, you don't even care uh, about uh, the problem of drift. Because if you want to get the position, you could double integrate the IMU. The problem is that with the IMU, with the double integrate, sorry, the, the acceleration signal coming from the IMU. The problem is if you do so with this IMU here, you get acceleration that has a, like a little uh, bias. And this bias, it's after double integration, we create a drift. So you think you're moving one meter forward and instead you're moving 
uh, 0.5 meters forward. So everything starts to go bad. So we see uh, another trick on how to compute the uh, position of the robot, which is solving a state estimation problem. Remember, we discussed in the yesterday about state estimation. Whenever we have some states that we cannot observe directly, and the position, the linear position of a base of a mobile robot is something that, like that, that we cannot measure. And this is, of course, increasing costs uh, for this, this kind of items. Sorry, what do you mean by integrating the acceleration of the item? So the, 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 the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity and the position. And, and the velocity is the derivative, first derivative of the position. So if we um, integrate the acceleration, we could get velocity. And doing another integration, ideally we could get the position. So this is this is a trick that you could use if you have perfect accelerometer uh, that provides you a ground truth acceleration of your body. But if you have the acceleration plus um, a constant term, when you integrate a constant, it becomes a ramp. And when you integrate again, the ramp becomes a parabola. So you see that your position has an error that with respect to the true value that you would be double integrating the true acceleration is affected by an additive um, error that is parabolic and is increasing with time due to the bias, the, the offset, the offset in the acceleration measurement. And this is very, growing very fast. You can see visibly the robot is still, you double integrate and see the, the position is increasing. It's like flying away uh, in, a few, in a few seconds. It's very big. Even, I mean, even with the KDH, which is 25,000, you cannot do that. Or you can do for a very short time before it builds up this, this error. Is it clear? Okay. Um, so how are they done, uh, built inside these accelerometers? They, uh, they use inertial forces. Um, uh, uh, and they, they, they are used to, to uh, in case they are using, used to, to also compute the gravity acceleration they can provide an output, um, gravity acceleration, they can provide an output as G. So you, you in the data sheet, find the accelerometer uh, range in, in terms of G sometimes. I don't like it. It's a non-SI unit. You should ever avoid uh, uh, to use non-SI units. And especially you should avoid to use imperial unit, please. Never write, uh, uh, foot or, or uh, um, um, apology, uh, how do you call them? Pinches, eh? thank you. Um, to uh, define your quantities, Columbia uh, Space Shuttle fall down because of one of these conversion problems. So <laughs> it was quite a, a, a problem. And the idea uh, to measure acceleration is using um, um, a mass called seismic mass that is suspended on a, on a force sensor. And um, this often is a piece of piezoelectric material that, that mimics a spring. So uh, the acceleration um, creates a, 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 a spring force, and from the spring force, we can we can we can build up a charge on the on the on the piezo, and we can measure discharge and and have an evaluation indirect of the of the acceleration. Um, there is not only a piezo resistive uh, type; uh, it's very good for ice shocks. This one and also measure the static acceleration. 
uh, but needs to be um, supplied. There is also crystal quartz that have better linearity and stability and a wider dynamic range um, and doesn't need power. Uh, but most of the modern solutions, they use uh, MEMS. MEMS uh, stands for, the acronym stands for Microelectromechanical System and provides um, an accelerometer sensor on inside the, an integrated circuit uh, at very low cost and very small. And this is what you have, for example, uh, in the micro strain, I think, and also in, uh, in the airbag of your car, whenever you, you do a crash, this needs to be detected as a deceleration uh, to, to power the, the airbag uh, inflation. Finally, the, uh, um, sorry, if you want to measure acceleration in the three direction, you need to have three of them uh, on orthogonal axis. And, and the application of using acceleration, accelerometers are for, uh, for example, vibration analysis uh, to this, uh, they are used in the, in, the, in the long range navigation. And also uh, they are part of the machinery that we will use uh, to uh, do state estimation. So to estimate the, the, the position, for example, and the linear position and velocity uh, of, a, of, a, of a mobile robot. And they are also essential uh, in controlling stability because if we kick, for example, the, uh, a legged robot sideways, it needs to feel this um, kick. And this is done by reading a very high spike in its acceleration signal, such that it can take an action, for example, stepping sideways to recover stability. Um, otherwise, they can be used, as I said at the beginning, uh, for collision detections. You can mount them in some part of, of uh, the manipulator, and whenever there is a um, same as a switch, uh, uh, where there's an impact, you see uh, a spike on the acceleration uh, of, the, of the link. Uh, that is, it's being the accelerometer glued rigidly to the link will be very, very accurate and very reactive in measuring. If you have some compliances between your accelerometer and the, the, the element you want to measure the acceleration, you will have a delay because any compliance is like a low pass filter that filters out the high frequency component of your impact force. So you need to be careful to don't put any, any even the glue or, or the, or the um, element that you use to attach it should be quite stiff, unless you don't want to do some filtering of some frequencies, then you, 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 you put a, um, a, a pad that is, is a little bit more compliant and you know that you, you will not detect the high frequency component of your, of your impact. Finally, uh, the last one um, is the gyroscope, the last inertial sensor and the gyroscope uh, senses, as I said, the uh, angular velocity of a body. And in a similar way uh, to what accelerometers do, do um, a gyroscope relies on, on um, uh, measuring an inertial force that is the Coriolis force. And do you know what, what Coriolis force is? Have you ever heard what, what, uh, what is Coriolis force? Yeah, we, omega omega. very good. Yeah, we will see what, what is the value, but the concept is that uh, non-inertial reference frame, it means that it, this frame is, is moving with respect to an inertial one. And if 
you are moving inside linearly inside this frame, but is on its say on its behalf rotating. This think about like a merry-go-round, and you are moving from the center to the periphery of the merry-go-round, and you you feel a force that pulls you back on the left, and this is the Coriolis force, and it's proportional to the angular velocity of the, of, the, of the disk in this case, and to the linear velocity you're moving to the, to the periphery, or you're, you're moving from the axis. And so if you know the linear velocity, you, and you measure this Coriolis force, you can get an estimate of the angular velocity. So same way as is in the, um, um, the accelerometer, I think there is a mass that is moving uh, with a known motion, some, um, and is applying a force on a spring. And the important point is that the Coriolis force is always orthogonal uh, to, the, to the linear velocity vector. And so you can uh, estimate, have an estimate of this um, Coriolis force and so uh, of the uh, measurement of this Coriolis force and you can get an estimate of the angular, angular velocity. Uh, originally, uh, in the past, uh, the, there were uh, another way, there was another way to, to, to do this uh, estimation of the angular velocity using um, um, the um, spinning masses. Uh, so think about, uh, this is, for example, a gyro compass. And uh, think about um, uh, a spinning mass that is rotating very fast and is allowed to, uh, um, um, to freely rotate inside a, a, a gimbal structure. So a structure that doesn't affect this motion, but um, the, the, the cage, let's say, is moving and, uh, and, uh, and uh, without applying any external force to the wheel. So what happens is that for, for the conservation, conservation of angular momentum is that you don't, if you don't have any external force and external torque in this case, the, uh, there is no uh, change in the, in the angular momentum that conserves. And this means that the, the, the uh, axis of rotation is not affected is, and the wheel still keeps uh, moving with the same axis. But if you are moving the outer cage, uh, there will be a relative motion uh, with respect to this rotating wheel. So you can measure, I don't know how we're doing with potentiometer or so on. You can measure the, the, angular, the angular velocity uh, on the free axis. But as I said, also in the case of um, uh, gyroscope, as happens for the accelerometers, they are now implementing this with, with MEMS and with the uh, or uh, optical laser based solution. So this is the, in the micro strain case, we have MEMS and they are built on the uh, electronic circuit itself. Otherwise in the KVH case, we have an optical uh, laser solution. Okay. Uh, I think this part is, is uh, complete. Um, do you have any other question? Not uh, we can do we can do a break. Okay. And 15, 15 minutes, ten minutes. I don't know how much we do with two hours. Okay. That's uh, fifty five. Come back and.
Sim. Sim. Volevo chiedere, secondo lei, quanto uh, libera sia uh, per uno studente che non ha mai...
chat. Let's see. It's a question from the eyes of online. Is the force generated on a moving body in a rotating frame? It's a fictitious force. And exactly, is a is a, a it's a, uh, acting on a moving body whenever this frame, uh, this body is moving with respect, with a relative motion with respect to the to a frame that is rotating on the, its behalf with respect to the inertia frame, which is fixed with the the with the with the it's not accelerating, it's not moving actually. Um, so yes. Um, <clears throat> So this this uh, um, other set of lectures, it's on the extraceptive sensors, and hope everybody can hear me and see everything properly. Um, first, the first uh, kind of uh, extraceptive sensor we are going to talk are the Force sensors or contact sensors uh, that uh, measure the interaction force. For example, uh, let's think we want to grasp an egg and we want to be able to control the force uh, to, uh, during the interaction. And we need to control the force because otherwise we break the egg we break the object we are grasping and to do so we need to measure um, the also the interaction force uh, um, with the environment and these forces can be uh, uh, depending on the kind of contact uh, linear forces pure linear forces like in the case of a point contact think about uh, i have a point foot touching a surface, I cannot apply, um, the contact cannot apply any moment on my, on my foot. But if I have a, a flat foot, I think the, the ground can apply on my, my flat foot also moments in the three direction. So uh, we have three forces and three moments. If I have a, um, a foot uh, on an edge, how many, what, what is the dimension of, uh, of the contact uh, space? Do you have any uh, idea? Five, yeah. I cannot uh, uh, have any, any, any moment around the line uh, uh, about which the, the foot is, is rotating. So it's unrelated on that situation. Um, so yeah, we could see uh, an application in robotics of these um, force sensors. Here usually is located the, the last link before the end of factor. And we can use, for example, in a peg in a hole task, which means put um, a cylinder inside a hole, like or detect the what is the right uh, matching for a piece, and easy the uh, the, the the mounting of, of this operation assembly operation, and. Usually, um, um, four sensors are implemented with the strain gauges. Um, strain gauges are um, um, in, in case of, for example, of of, uh, of uh, electrical motors, you might directly uh, measure the 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 action force or the action torque in the case of an electrical motor. Uh, by measuring the current in the armature of the circuit of the motor. But the uh, problem of doing so uh, is that this measurement 
uh, is not really the torque that goes to the to the link to accelerate the link, because in the middle there is the friction, and the friction where is located normally is in the bearing, or in the uh, in other component that are, are sliding. So uh, to be sure that you're you're applying uh, measuring the the torque of your joint, you need to um, have a, a, an element that is a torque sensor that is right uh, attached to the to the to the moving link. Um, and in the case of a, a, um, a torque sensor, we use a, um, um, uh, we indirectly uh, measure the the formation uh, uh, the action of the force. Uh, measuring the deformation of an elastic element that is subject to the force or the torque to be measured. And to capture this deformation, we use, um, there are several ways uh, that are based on different uh, principles, basic principles, uh, could be like um, variation in the capacity or the resistance or uh, some piezoelectric effect or optical interferometry. So what we want to do is to um, measure the external force applied to, the, um, to our robot measuring the deformation. And we want to measure, find a way to measure the deformation. And the most um, common way is to use strain gauges because of their ruggedness and simplicity. Uh, um, and the strain gauges are based uh, on the concept uh, uh, of resistance variation in a, of a metal conductor. So you need to think about to, um, a, a very uh, thin uh, conductor that is glued onto a surface uh, um, that is deforming. Uh, and this conductor is under, uh, undergoes the same strain and, and, and deformation, which is the, um, a relative, relative deformation is a strain uh, of the part that is mounted on. And um, so, uh, as I said, the, the strain gauges measure the relative deformation uh, that is called strain of the material. And uh, whenever they uh, deform, uh, the resistance of the wire changes. In, in particular, the wire could be stretched or could be compressed and changing is changing its length and cross-sectional area. And so the resistance is varying according to the compression extension of the, of the string gauge. And if the, the formation stretch the, the, the gauge, um, then the cross-sectional area decreases because of the Poisson ratio and resistance increases. The resistance uh, in the this is a, a a cut of the of the of the uh, wire of the strain gauge, and we see that the resistance it's um, according to the uh, electric electric uh, uh, resistivity equation, it's um, um, proportional to the resistivity, which is uh, uh, the raw value and uh, directly proportional to the length of the conductor and inversely proportional to the, to the, to the area of the conductor. And uh, um, to define the sensitivity of, of, uh, of uh, a strain gauge, we use the gauge factor. That is um, um, a measure of the capacity of the strain gauge to change its uh, resistance with respect to the uh, relative deformation, which is uh, in face of a relative deformation, which is the, uh, uh, the, the we call the strain. So the strain is the, the ratio between the changing length uh, with respect to the un initial unstressed, uh, unstressed reference length uh, and the, um, and so, yeah, the change, uh, the ratio between the, uh, the, the the changing length due to the stress with respect to the uh, initial unstressed reference length, and um, so if we have, a, a, for example, um, a data sheet, we can we can see here um, 
the operating strain. So uh, in this case, uh, a micro strain is just uh, a, 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 a dimensional unit of measure that is um, uh, obtained by a, 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 is it a dimensional because the changing length and the length have the same measure, the unit of measure in meters. And um, the, we see here that is, uh, the operating strain uh, range is 2,000, plus minus 2,000. And um, um, we see here that whatever we, we discussed yesterday about the linearity, that we have uh, um, linearity only in a part of the range, which is 1,500. So beyond this, this range, we the, 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 the gauge start to behave non-linearly. This is the gauge factor under 40. And the resistance, uh, this is not uncertainty, uh, as we discussed yesterday, but it's, it's just a change in the resistance with respect to a default value, which is the resistance that the gauge has in case of no deformation. So whenever you mount the gauges, um, you need to mount in a specific way. Let's think you are doing like um, uh, applying a force here, and this beam it's a it's a it's a it's a steel let's say uh, element that deforms under the uh, under the action of the force, and uh, whenever it deforms, you you have that the top gauge uh, are uh, extended while the um, bottom one are compressed. And you should mount them in the direction of the normal stress. And the normal stress is, is, is in this direction in case of a flexional uh, situation. And you cannot put 90 degrees, like, otherwise they are not sensitive. And these gauges are, are, uh, are glued onto the surface. You need to clean up the surface very nicely and, um, and then put a glue. And then when you place the gauges with the glue, and you let the glue um, uh, dry out, then you can solder the terminal of the gauge uh, with very thin wires. And to, to be small, uh, we know that uh, to be accurate, we want a big resistance change. So we want a big length of the conductor uh, because the resistance will be higher if the, if the conductor is longer. And so, but we want to keep the gauge small so we wire up the uh, conductor in the in the, in the in the in the direction of we want to measure the, the change um, the deformation and we they have these these patterns to to have long long conductors with small uh, occupation of occupancy and the gauges uh, why are they so, so are so uh, so widely used because they are inexpensive and they can use be used to be measure a wide range of range of strains uh, with accuracies under one percent. And but they require calibration before uh, use. So whenever you glue them, you don't know uh, what the uh, reading uh, of the resistance uh, that is this um, obtained with the with the voltage. We see next slide. Uh, divider, um, how this reading is related to the force that is applied. So you need uh, to perform a calibration, making a reading without load, and then apply gradually different uh, increasing loads in order to find different voltage reading and associate the voltage reading to the loads. To the forces. To read the string gauges, uh, we use a very uh, simple uh, uh, circuit that is called uh, Wheatstone Bridge. And wherever we have um, a battery, a power supply, sorry, and we have, um, because we want to measure both positive and negative deformations, we want to be able to read. Um, uh, uh, this this uh, as a, as a positive negative voltages, uh, and so we uh, the simplest way is um, to have a voltage divider 
between two resistors that creates a fixed voltage. So if we have these two resistors that are equal, this voltage will be half of this voltage because it's R2 divided by R1 plus R2 and they are equal. And the other terminal is this, and the voltage of this uh, point will be dependent on the value of RS because if RS reduces, this point moves toward VI as we saw before for the potentiometer. And if this RS increases, then this point moves potential this point moves toward the, the, the ground. So uh, across these two points, we can, we can read uh, positive negative um, voltage according to the value of the resistance of the gauge. Everything is clear about this arrangement. Um, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's good that to have zero reading whenever everything is unstressed, is, is there's no force applied that all these resistance are the same. And also the resistance of the gauge, it's, it's the same as, as the fixed resistors. And if we do this um, simple computation with Computing voltage divider for, for, the, for this point, uh, that is this, and the voltage divider for this point, that is this, we get the expression of the output voltage uh, for the variation of the, of the gauge in resistance of the gauge. But you remember that uh, I told you before that if you compress or uh, uh, you apply a flexion, uh, a fractional force on a beam, this, the, 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 the gauges uh, that are glued on top uh, extend and the one on top bottom, they compress. So the one on top, they get longer and the one on bottom, bottom ones, they become shorter. So the resistivity, the resistance of the one on top increases and the one the, resist the resistance of the gauges mounted uh, on the bottom part, it decreases of the same amount. And we can um, exploit this fact to uh, increase the sensitivity. So you see um, the one that decreases is, is this one, the one increases that. And for the same um, uh, deformation, we get double the, the, the voltage change. So the, the vo this point will move much more than in this case twice. So we double the sensitivity this way. But uh, an important point uh, is uh, that all these resistors, they change their resistance also with temperature. And this is the most uh, uh, important issue of the gauges, that they, 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 the resistance change also with, temp with temperature. But with this arrangement, if you uh, select resistors that um, are, uh, have the same temperature coefficient, so they change the resistance with temperature in the same way, this means that they are thermally coupled, then all the variation that are common modes, so they are, they are very slowly changing variation, due to the temperature, they are compensated, and this becoming, um, in essence, independent of the, of the temperature. And I saw, for example, uh, when I was designing uh, my foot sensor um, with gauges, that if I selected uh, wrongly the pair of, of, of gauges and they were not coupled, you could see even with five degrees of changes in the, in the temperature that you, you had a drift, uh, a wrong readings uh, in the voltage. So one day you get for the same weight uh, a voltage reading and the day after that was slightly colder, uh, you could see uh, that the voltage reading was different and it was due to temperature. That's why these sensors are very expensive because you need a lot of expertise to design them. There's a question, uh, how much reliable? <laughs> the, the, the point is it's uh, 
exactly this I, I'm talking about. Um, if you don't match it properly, if you have a difference between one resistor and the other, that you know that resistances resistors come with a certain tolerance. One percent resistors, five percent resistors. It means that resistance uh, is is not really five hundred ohms, let's say, but it's five hundred plus five ohms. So you need to select a very low um, uh, tolerance, at least one percent, I would say, even slow, smaller if they exist, and in order to reduce the the this uh, this inaccuracy due to the to the differences. Uh, yeah, for the rest, they are very rugged. They 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 can. They are quite robust, but they need to be calibrated. And to do so, you need to. Uh, you will see uh, in the next slide uh, an important point. Uh, I will tell you afterwards. So for. The gauges can be used both for uh, torque sensors that are uniaxial, so they measure only torque in, in, one, in one axis, or for six axis for torque sensors that I told you before are used at the end effector. And uh, as you saw from the video, they are normally mounted at the wrist um, before the end effector. And one part of the sensor is directly connected to the link, the other is connected to the elastic part of the sensor. So uh, we have, uh, in essence, an, um, a shape uh, that is um, made of uh, um, metal, but is a kind of elastic. And um, how many gauges we need to use, there should be at least one pair in, in, for any direction that we want to measure. Uh, so if you have a six axis for stored sensors, we need at least at least six pairs of gauges. And this is the shape of the elastic element. Uh, I was telling you it is cross is called Maltese cross. And this is the end effector. And here we have the contact forces. So we will see in the kinematic class lecture that you need Whenever, whatever you read from this um, force sensor, force torque sensor, you need a transformation, a rigid transformation to compute the real uh, contact force and moments at the contact point. Because the reading is done here, but you want to estimate the contact force here. And um, these are uh, uh, the most famous brand of uh, six axis force sensors that is called ATI. Uh, and you can see already that this, even the uh, a small model, uh, I don't know if you can read this, it's around, uh, no, it's very bad, um, 500 Newton range, um, the mini 45. Uh, it's very expensive. It's almost 6,000 euros because they need a lot of expertise to be glued. They need a lot of expertise to be temperature compensated and to be uh, to reduce the noise. Uh, and as I said, this is uh, uh, the elastic element, which is a Maltese cross, cross configuration. And uh, in general, as four deformable elements, that are called spokes. I show a drawings. So these are the spokes. And uh, we have two pair train, strain gauges uh, mounted on, uh, uh, on, uh, on each side, uh, on two sides of this, on each side of these spokes. And, uh, um, and you see that if you are applying a force in this direction, you will have a deformation of this way, of this arrangement whenever you apply a, a, a force in this direction you will have um, a bending and so you can understand from the bending uh, in here you have this uh, strain gauges that will bend the same way and in this case this will compress will extend and this will compress so we can discriminate different uh, uh, loadings seeing the bending of the of the of the different bending of the of the gauges 
So in case of we want to measure uh, both forces and torques, we need at least eight pairs with this arrangement. So one of, on this side and one on the top side. Otherwise, if we want to only to measure linear forces, we need four pairs. So only on, uh, on, 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 on top and bottom of these of this spokes. And uh, why eight pairs? Because um, it's very difficult to, uh, ideally we need six, but it's very difficult to obtain uh, um, um, uh, um, an, a, a nice measure with only six pairs. So I normally use more to have some redundancy. But um, yeah, so um, how do we read them? Uh, now we have all the gauges mounted on the sides, this side and at top side of, 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 the, of, the, of the spoke. And we have um, uh, eight pairs so we have uh, eight bridges eight Whitstone bridges and we get eight voltage readings and these are the voltage readings and we want to get out the 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 loading condition so the the set of uh, the vector of uh, linear and forces and moments at this in this point in this frame so we we build up this calibration matrix that maps the eight voltages into forces and um, so the sensor frame is, is located here, and this is the calibration matrix, and this is the uh, uh, the output of the of the of the measurement from the voltage dividers from the Whetstone bridges, and the calibration means to uh, find out what are these uh, numbers that map the voltages into 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 forces, and to do so we apply. Um, uh, known uh, force um, loading. Um, let's say we apply. We have a we have a um, uh, um, the end effector here. We apply a weight of ten kilograms in in here, and this will create a, a certain loading. We create a a, a moment about uh, uh, the, this axis and a force along this direction. Then we apply uh, a 20 kilogram, if we, if we get the readings, then we apply a 20 kilogram weight in the same direction. Then we rotate the sensor uh, under 80 degrees and we do the same. So we try to apply different loadings and then uh, with least square regression, we can find out what is this, uh, how does this matrix looks like. And then whenever we want to use our sensor, we code the matrix in our software. We read the voltages uh, with an acquisition board, and we, we will get the values of the forces and moments at the fan sensor frame. Then, if we want to get at the end effector frame, we still need to do an, uh, the, uh, another transformation to, to map these forces and moments to the contact point. And this is like, uh, um, as I said, a, a configuration, another configuration, three spokes. This is this I did it at the beginning of my uh, PhD. And, and again, you have a, a pair in one, in one side and in the other side, but you have only, you're only using six pairs. And an important point uh, is to use, reduce the wire um, between uh, the, uh, the, the two uh, Whitstone uh, uh, sides, because normally this is uh, happening at the acquisition board level, and this is happening on the on the on the on the on the spoke itself. So uh, you, if you have a long wire, you will have a lot of of coupled noise, and you will have also some voltage drop here, and you you will have uh, this will affect the reading. The reading. So to improve the signal to noise ratio, the gauge wires must be as short as possible, and this means that amplification of the signals should be done very close to the sensing elements. And for doing so, we were in, in designing a, an electronic board that it's attached exactly on top of the of the sensor. And this was the real prototype that we were uh, building. Also, the ATI sensor as the uh, amplification board inside the cage of the sensor.
you see here application uh, of, of uh, these or sensors for assembly operations. We like to go for no, I cannot go. Yeah, it was the one of the application of application. So it checks the contact the and then it goes inserting to the 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 the, the camshaft inside the motor. And here is uh, another application of a uh, sensors for finishing a uh, piece. So we have a uh, sandpaper going moving and we want to remove all the burrs due to the after the the, the <clears throat> fusion ah, so whenever you, you 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 create a piece you can have some parts that you want to remove um you and you want to do uh with this this uh, procedure um yeah i would say that before going to the next part, uh, we stop here. Uh, the next part will be about vision sensors. And if you have any question, uh, then you can ask. Otherwise, uh, see you next week. I will put the slides, the updated slides in the in the in the, in the um, on the on the Moodle, are you able to access the Moodle now? Was the problem solved? Because today I I asked, they noticed the problem. Okay, so the one that cannot access, send me an email. I will send you the the Dropbox links with the uh, with the slides and also with the video recording. Of the of the video lectures, okay. In the meanwhile, we we do like this, or uh, or I can type in the chat. No, but maybe that then it doesn't get. Just just send me an email the ones that that don't don't have access, okay. Thank you very much. Let's stop the share.